Good morning, church family. How is everybody today? Is everybody good? Yeah, everybody wonderful. Good, good. I love it. My name is David McMahon. I'm the student pastor here at Anthem Community Church, and you have the extreme privilege to, to get to hear from me this morning. You're welcome. You're welcome. You can, you can thank our pastor for that. Uh, he and uh, Miss Lisa have, ta- have taken the weekend. Uh, it seems like an anniversary or I don't know something. He's gone. <laughs> anyways, anyways, you get to hear from me this morning. Um, and I have to tell you, like, I am super, super excited. No, I, no, no, no lie. Uh, I love the series that we're in. You know, we're talking all about David. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know if you knew this or not, but David is one of my favorite Bible characters. We have a lot in common. Not, not everything, babe. Don't worry about that. But we have, you know, all the good stuff, all the good stuff, you know, courageous, you know, David was good looking. We're getting there, right? We're getting there. (laughs) No, but I'm excited to be here and talk to you about David. I'm excited to talk to you because uh, David was, man, he was such an amazing, an amazing character. Um, He was what I believe is like a full man because he had it all. Really, he had it all. Um, But before we get into that, have any of you guys ever been someplace and had the thought to yourself, like, how did I get here? Right? Yeah, if you have an app on your phone with that maps, GPS, if you've ever used that, yeah, man, I've done that. You get someplace and you're like, man, how did I get here? Right? Uh, Well, more specifically, have you ever been in, in a conversation with somebody and like all of a sudden you're, you're standing there going, man, I don't know. Like, this is not what we were talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you want to experience that, we're looking for some small group leaders for the middle schoolers. <laughs> um, and th- that is a great opportunity for you to really understand and get to know what I'm talking about here. I can remember one time, uh, we've been, we've, Chas and I have been in student ministry for a while. Um, and I can remember one time we were having a small group at our house. Okay. And I, I don't really remember the topic. I, I can, I, I can't remember. Um, but we had a bunch of middle schoolers there, you know, um, and it came time like, Hey, do you guys have any questions? Which is very dangerous. It's best if you just don't ask, but, but I did, I said, Hey, do you guys have any questions? We were early in the ministry and, and a, a young man, he raises his hand. Now he's a troublemaker. I know he's a troublemaker, <laughs> but I figured it would be something about what's for dinner. Right. You know, I figured that's how we were going to get, we were going to get this. But he says, he says, Hey David, he says, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. What is it? He said, I thought you said that you're only supposed to have one wife or one husband, you know? And in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, you've been reading the Old Testament. You're going to start talking about Solomon, aren't you? I know your game, buddy. And so, you know, I said, hey, listen, man, in the Old Testament, okay, in the Old Testament, things were, things were a little bit different. Just because a king did it did not mean that was God's plan, Okay, God had a bigger plan. He goes, no, 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 no. He said, I thought you said that we're all going to be married to Jesus when we get to heaven. Yeah. Yeah, I don't don't know how to answer that question. Yeah, yeah. He says, and and he said, David, he said, if we're all married to Jesus, does that mean that Jesus is gay because he'd be married to me? (laughs) And I'm going to be honest with you, in that moment, um, very, very seldom in my life do I not know what to say. I did not know what to say because I didn't want to go into like, you know, marriage and what marriage here and marriage there means and all that stuff. So I did what all good youth pastors did. I said, hey, listen, ask your dad. <laughs> yeah, I gave it to him. <laughs> when dad picked up, came to pick him up that night, you know, good luck, man. <laughs> I don't know. You know, best I got is Jesus is not gay. <laughs> go with that. You know, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> But sometimes in life, man, we just get to a place where like, man, I don't know how we got here. I don't know. And I love that, that in this series that that has not been the case. Okay. I love in this series that that has not been the case because we've talked about David, right? The, this man who, who kills a giant. And we know that when, J, when David stepped out on that battlefield, that was not the first time that he had held a slingshot. So when, when we hear the story that David defeated Goliath with, with a stone, that makes sense. We know how he got there, right? 
when we see David leading the nation of Israel, and we see David um, leading his men in, in battle, when we see him doing all these things as this mighty king and increasing borders and, and doing it, you know, uh, being able to choose, you know, what the right path is and how to do this, we know that it wasn't the first time that he had led people. Because there was a time when he was in a cave with 30 or so guys and, and like, I don't know what to do. And so when we see David later on in his life leading, you know, thousands, it's because we know that he had led the small group too, right? He had led, he'd led through everything. And so we can see this picture of David as this, as this warrior and we know how. And we see him as this, this mighty king and we know how, Right? Well, we cannot forget another aspect of David's life. And, and the, the way that I say that he's a complete, uh, a complete godly man, there was a third aspect to David's life that we can't forget about. We can't forget that this man, David, wrote over half of the Psalms. These were songs that were written to worship our Lord. Songs that were written to talk about who he would be and how he would come and, and who God was and the, and, and the faith no, no, David understood worship. And so David, another aspect of his character was he is, was a worshiper that I think that all of us should strive to be one day, right? I think that he was the man that we can look to and say that if we want to be a follower of God, if we want to believe, be a believer to Jesus Christ in the right way, we can look at his life and say that, hey, listen, there are mistakes, but we see that this is how that we're supposed to do it. We see that this is what it is. But just like, just like, David was a king, and we saw where that came from. David was a warrior, and we saw where that came from. I don't think David just sat down with a pen and a pad one day and wrote, you know, 75 psalms. Like, oh, yeah, this is, this is easy for me. No, no, there was a path that got him there, okay? And so the first thing that we have to know today is that worship is more than we think. It's way more than we think. It's more than just coming to church on a Sunday morning, singing some songs, listening to a good-looking youth pastor talk to you. It's more than that, right? And so what I would like to do today is to unpack it just a little bit. I would like to unpack worship for us. And let's see if we can't learn something from the life of David about what it means to be a worshiper of the Lord, a worshiper of God. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to 2 Samuel chapter 6. We're going to read verses 14 and 16 first. And I'm going to give you a little background in this, okay? So what we have here is we have David bringing the Ark of the Covenant back into the city of David, into Jerusalem, okay? So in this moment, we have David leading kind of like a parade with this Ark, okay? For those of you who don't know, the Ark of the Covenant was something that was, uh, uh, in those days, it was kind of like a box. It was a special box, but it was a box that held some, some really big deal things, in it, okay? It had like the Ten Commandments, well, the second set of Ten Commandments. It had a jar of manna. It had a staff that Aaron had carried. So these were things that reminded the children of Israel about who they were, about where they had come in from. These were, these were significant, right? And so this box contained them. And the children of Israel knew that also within this box, there were a couple of cherubim, like um, um, kind of like angelic people that, that, that um, were, were formed on top of it, like out of gold, and they said that the presence of God it dwelled there, okay? And what had happened is that the Ark of the Covenant had been captured by the Philistines. And so the children of Israel that actually cared about this box, that cared about what it contained, that cared about all these things, it was taken from them, and David didn't like this at all. One of, the, one of his main duties, one of the biggest things that he wanted to do, that, he's, that he had that he had to get done before he left being king of the people was he had to go and reclaim this box. So what did David do? He went down to the Philistines. Uh, he stomped some stuff. And then he came back with the box, right? And so this is where we pick it up, that David is coming into the city of David with, with this, um, this Ark of the Covenant, okay? 2 Samuel 6, verses 14 through 16, it says, And David danced before the Lord with all his might, wearing a priestly garment, so David and all the people of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts of joy and the blowing of ram's horns. But as the ark of the Lord entered the city of David, Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked down from her window when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. She was filled 
with contempt for him. So right here we get a picture of David worshiping, okay? And it may not look the way that we would think worship looks. It definitely doesn't look that way. Well, Josh jumps sometimes, right? So it maybe it looks a little bit like that. But it says in scripture that David was dancing and jumping with all of his might. Think about that picture. That is everything. That is everything, that he is dancing and jumping before the Lord. Chronicles also talks about this scripture. It also talks about this this history. And it says that David was skipping. This is a word that's used for like children as they play, right? So, So David is dancing. David is skipping. Definitely not, we would think, a a, a dignity. The king, this is not the behavior of a king. And David's wife looks down and he says, she says, no, no, no. This is inappropriate, David. This is not good. And I want you guys to see what, what David's response to her was. It's found in verse 22. It says, yes, and I'm willing to look even more foolish than this, even to be humiliated in my own eyes. Now think about that. David looks at his wife, which is very dangerous, right? So if your wife tells you something, but David looks at his wife and he looks down, he looks up at her and he says, you know what? He said, not only am I willing to look ridiculous and foolish, be humiliated in front of all of these people, I'll even do it to the point that I would think it's foolish, that I would think it's dumb. David was willing to worship God in spite of anything, in spite of anyone right? And so one of the things that we have to understand is that if we want to worship like David, worship grows in spite of others. Worship was never meant to be something that had to have a group to do it. I know I, when we come to church and, and we worship the Lord, this is, this is wonderful. This is great. I believe that it's biblical. But do you know that you don't have to have a group of people and a full band to worship the Lord? That was never the intent. God didn't need that. God didn't, he did not require that, right? Worship, even in a group, is not about the group. Worship is only about you and him. And that's it. No one else is needed. Two or three are gathered. Nope. Your father in heaven wants to connect with you in a personal way. And to worship him, you don't need anybody else. So we understand that we don't need people to worship. I I get that. But what does it look like? Okay? Because I go to this church and worship looks like this. And I go to this church and and worship looks like this. And then this guy on TV says that worship is this. And I've heard tell and we see David here dancing. And so what is worship? Let's, let's, Let's look at this. What is worship really? Like what am I supposed to know? Well, the first thing to understand is that worship also grows as we grow. One of the really, really cool things about the Bible, and, and I love these little, these little gems that God plants for us that he's put in scripture that, that maybe when they come alive to us, it's like, wow, it's like I just woke up. This is so cool. One of those is right here. So we see, we see David, okay, and we see this worshiper that he is, and we wonder how did he get there, right? Right? In the Bible, it gives the lineage of David in three or four places, two of them in the New Testament when it talks about Jesus' lineage, okay? So we probably know from from a few weeks ago, uh, David's dad was a man named Jesse, right? Okay, Jesse's dad was a man named Obed. Now, that's a cool name. It's not one that I would put in a baby book, you know, but that's that's okay. Obed, that sounds like a, you know, I don't don't know what it sounds like. It's, It's a name, right? It, it, it seems like something that you would get picked on in middle school for. I don't know. Obed, right? In the Hebrew culture, they didn't give you the name based off of what the popular names were for the year. They didn't give you a name based off of, you know, what they thought sounded good. You know, um, sometimes you would be named because of a characteristic you had when you were born, right? Esau, he was red when he was born, so he was named Esau, which means red, you know, sometimes you would be, you would be uh, named based off of family, right? Who you were in that family, right? Sometimes you would be named based off of like prophecy. You know, your parents would name you something because they believed that this is who you would be one day. Names were very, very important. And a lot of times the names actually had a meaning outside of what we would just read uh, like, like, like Obed, 
right? The word Obed actually means in Hebrew, worshiper. So you, wait a minute, you have a grandson who is this amazing worshiper. I wonder where it came from. I wonder if his grandfather, who was named worshiper, had any influence at all in his grandson becoming a worshiper. I believe that worship, a lot of times, is through legacy. And I, I'm not going to say that it's just legacy in a family, okay? I do believe that that's important. A, a, as a dad, it's important that we bring our children to church, okay? But it's more important that, that we live as a Christian outside of the church so that they see that. That is very, very important. And so as parents, seriously, one of the most important things you can do is show your children faith, right? Not just on Sunday morning, but through the week. Absolutely. But the legacy goes further than that because we have generations and generations and generations of Christians who've walked before us. And as, the, as such, it's our responsibility to make sure that Christianity continues for, for generations and generations and generations past us. It's our responsibility to teach what worship is. It's our responsibility to show them the importance of worship, not just as parents, but as a church body, as people. Because let's be honest, sometimes our parents weren't necessarily Christians. So we have to find out somewhere. It's our church's responsibility to understand what worship is. Now, I know what you're thinking, and it's okay. You're thinking, David, that's your job. You're the youth pastor. You teach the youth about worship. Isn't that what you get paid to do? That's your responsibility, right? A few years back, um, there was uh, some research that was put in um, to our society and culture, and, and, and it found that there's a trend called the soccer mom trend. Now, pay attention. This is not about soccer moms. The soccer mom trend went something like this. It said that mom has Tommy, and Tommy wants to play soccer. Great. Mom doesn't know how to play soccer. So what does mom do? Mom takes Tommy to a soccer coach. She says, you teach Tommy soccer. Coach says, okay, have Tommy here at soccer every night and on Saturdays for a game. So mom's responsibility in the game of soccer and teaching soccer is to make sure that Tommy goes to practice and that Tommy goes to game. Hands off, no problem. Well, as a society, we really like this. We really like taking the responsibility that we have and allowing someone else to do it for us. So what happened is this actually went on and, and it went into our school system. We have teachers who teach math. Tommy needs to know math. Dad doesn't know math. So what does dad do? Dad makes sure that Tommy is at school to learn math. Tommy, learn math. Teacher, teach Tommy math responsibility over. The only problem is that you've now given a responsibility to somebody that never had that responsibility. It's not our teacher's responsibility to raise our children. It is not our teacher's responsibility to teach them all that they need to know about life. As a matter of fact, there's this thing that we all hate called homework, okay? It was actually created because it's your responsibility to show your child how to do things. In a classroom of 30 or 40 kids, it's impossible to make sure that everybody understands. So homework is sent home because as a parent, it is your responsibility to teach math. Not teacher's responsibility, your responsibility. Let me illustrate it this way. If I take my taxes to H&R Block, and the man at H&R Block messes up my taxes, and I send them in, does the IRS call the man at H&R Block and say, you owe us money? Who do they call? It's my responsibility. Did he mess it up? Sure. Whose responsibility is it to make sure that it's right? Mine. Even if sometimes I don't fully understand what's going on, it's my responsibility to learn what's going on, to understand what's going on, because responsibility is mine, right? Well, in the church, it's no different. The next generation, the responsibility is ours, shared. It's all our responsibility to make sure they understand. And so, listen, for all of you that say that the next generation is scary and, it, you know, that, that, oh my gosh, they're just lost and all this, well, it's your fault. Seriously, because as a church, it's our responsibility to lead the next generation. And I'm not telling you you have to get up and teach. But you could be nice to somebody in the parking lot. I mean, I'm, just, I'm just saying, right? 
So half of, half of learning as we grow is our legacy, right? Right. Another half is in experiences. In experiences. I believe that we learn how to worship through experiences. And not all of these experiences are necessarily positive. Do you know that when we see David coming into the city of David, when we see this celebration, this parade, this is a wonderful picture. And we look at it and we say, oh, this is so cool. Look, King David is worshiping. He's jumping. This is wonderful. I love this. What you don't understand if you haven't read scripture is that this is the second attempt at bringing the ark back into the city. It didn't go so well the first time. The first time, David and and the people, they go and they reclaim this ark. And as they're coming back into the city, they're worshiping and they're dancing and they're doing all these things. One of the oxen that was pulling the cart with the ark on it stumbles. The ark starts to wobble. And a priest puts his hand up on the ark to steady it. He dies. Immediately. Dead. See, what David had done is he had been so excited about the celebration. He had been so excited about what was going on, about how the whole thing was going on. He had failed to read the instructions. Yes, David was a man. He had failed to read the instructions that the Old Testament that God gave in how to properly handle the ark. This kind of seems like a trend with him after last week, right? I mean, David, come on, seriously, just read something occasionally, you know, reading. But David had, had failed to read the, the, the rules that said that you as a person cannot touch the ark, that there's a certain way to transport it. There's a certain way to, to carry it. There's a certain way to do all of these things. And now David was standing with a bunch of scared people and a dead priest and having to understand that, hey, listen, there is a wrong way to worship. There's a wrong way to do things, right? Right? In this moment, though, there's another one of these little gems that God likes to hide for us. In this moment, David decides that, hey, listen, let's regroup. Maybe I need to go read some instructions, okay? So we're going to go back. We're going to talk to the priest. We're going to figure out how to carry this thing. While we do it, let's store it at this house right here next door. So David goes to this house, and it turns out that the name of the man that owned this house was Obed-Edom, right? Obed-Edom, in Hebrew, translated, is servant of Edom. Or it could be slave of Edom. Oh, I see your faces. Now you're thinking the youth pastor, he's messed up. Oh, you got it wrong, man. Because earlier, David, you told us that Obed means worshiper. Now, all of a sudden, you're trying to say that Obed means slave. So which is it, worshiper or slave? David, you're going to have to choose one, right? What we don't understand is that in the Hebrew culture, those were the same. Worshipper and slave are the exact same thing. Worshipper and servant are the exact same thing. Worshipper and worker are the exact same thing. We have this man, King David, who, who was literally titled a man after God's own heart. He was such a warrior, worshiper, king, that God said that that's the guy. Nobody else in scripture got that. God said that that is my man. Why? Because David understood something that we have long forgotten. David understood that to be a worshiper was also to be a servant. To be a worshiper was also to be a worker. To be a worshiper was also to be a slave. It doesn't happen by accident. Our mindsets have to change. Worship will only happen through intentionality. Our heart has to turn towards the Lord. Our mind has to turn towards the Lord. That is the only way. The difference between the right way to worship and the wrong way to worship has nothing to do with what you're doing. In fact, worshiping does not just consist of singing. Worshiping is not just playing an instrument. No, literally, if we look at scripture, everything that you do can be worship. Everything. As a matter of fact, as a Christian, everything you do should be worship. You say, well, hold on a minute, man. I got a jerk boss. 
You telling me that I'm supposed to worship at work? Whoa, David, the people I work with are not Christians. They don't believe like I do. How am I supposed to worship at work? How am I supposed to do all these things? Years later, the Apostle Paul, he had an answer to that because he was being asked the exact same question when Paul was teaching them that worship consisted of everything you do in your life. Everything that you do is an act of worship. And the man asked, Paul, how can this be? Paul had an answer. In Colossians 3, verse 23, the Apostle Paul says, Work willingly at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than people. The Apostle Paul said, hey, listen, it's easy. Because when you're at work and you're working for the jerk, you're not working for the jerk, you're working for God. That changes the way we treat him. When we're at work and we have to deal with these difficult customers and people that really bother us, we, we're supposed to treat them as if we were serving the Lord. When you're at school and you're with the teacher who's a, 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 a real nut job, you treat them like the Lord. That's how. That's an act of worship. When, when you're taking care of kids, that's an act of worship. When you're picking up trash in a parking lot, that can be an act of worship. Everything that we do is supposed to be directed towards the Lord. The Apostle Paul says that everything you do, do as unto the Lord. Now here's a scary thought. You can worship by accident, just not God by accident. You can worship by accident. You just can't worship God by accident. You know, when you were born, you were given a name, right? All right duh, David, we got it, right? Well, you actually given a name on the other side of heaven as well, right? Your name in heaven begins with the name Obed. Because the truth is, is that all of us were created to work all of us were created to serve. All of us were created to worship. So whichever name you want to take, you, you are Obed. The only thing is that a lot of times in our lives, we start to get things screwed up. We start to get things mixed up, and we don't really realize who we're working for or who we're worshiping. Sometimes our name, as we begin to grow up, it, it looks something like this. Maybe we are Obed Success. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm Obed success because I've become a slave to making sure I'm successful. I've become a slave to making sure that, that I can get things done, that our family has enough money. Okay, well, what about that one? There's a good one. Maybe in your life you have become Obed family because you serve your family. Family is the most important thing in the universe to you. I work, everything I do, the sacrifices, it's for my family. And what you've done is you've become a servant to your family. That's not worshiping God. Maybe, maybe your name is Obed Joneses. Do you guys know what I mean by that? Is that an old name? Yeah, yeah. You get it. You're keeping up with whoever else is going, whatever else is going on in your neighborhood. You're keeping up with whatever else is going on, right? Obed Joneses, my, my job is to make sure that I am with everyone else. My job is to make sure that I have the same or look the same or whatever. What we don't know is that we've done it. We've named ourselves. We are Obed something, because we are made to work, we are made to serve, we are made to worship. Now, our choice is the second name. The first name, we didn't get a choice. We are worshipers of someone. Who are you worshiping? What does your name tag look like? As you leave this week, I want you to think about it. Who do you serve? Who do you work for? And at the end of the week, I hope you can understand that the reason that David was different, the reason that David was, was so different from, from everyone else is because everything that he did, did he serve his family? Yes, he took care of his family. You can read it in scripture, but it was with his heart turned towards God. He treated his family, everything that he did with his family was because he did it for God. The battles that he had and that he won, 
He didn't do those for success. He did those for God. All you have to do is read the story of Goliath and you can see that David completely and totally turns everything back to God. It's not for the city of uh, the nation of Israel. It's not for his family. It's not for success. The reason that David was seen as a man after God's own heart, the reason that David was the worshiper he was is because he understood that everything he did was an act of worship. So what's your name? What does your name tag say? Let's pray. Father God, we love you. Uh, God, we thank you for understanding. We thank you for little nuggets of truth, little nuggets of wisdom that you put in scripture for us that you, that you desire to talk to us and to speak to us in. God, we ask that you would help us this week um, to become true worshipers. We love you. It's in your name.